Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Sam. And thanks everybody for being here this afternoon. I'm Anna Kraft, and I'm going to be talking about evaluating journal quality and avoiding those predatory, exploitative, and questionable journals that are out there. Um, so this is me. I'm the coordinator of metadata services here in the UNCG University Libraries. And part of my work involves uh, a lot of scholarly communication initiatives, helping researchers um, and helping them evaluate journals and also working with open access and our open access database NC Docs that you may be familiar with that shares a lot of faculty and student scholarship. Um, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to quickly talk about what open access is and how that relates to all of this. We'll recognize some predatory publishing practices and look at examples of solicitations and websites associated with some predatory publishers. We will share some resources to help you evaluate journal quality, and we'll have time for questions as well. So a question for y'all as we get started. Have you encountered any journals or other publications that seemed like they might be predatory or questionable? And if you don't know how to define predatory in this context, uh, that's okay. We'll get into that in just a minute. So if you have any experience with this, um, feel free to share it in the chat. Yeah, so Sam definitely has. We have talked about some of this before. Um, and predatory conferences, yeah, we will talk about that. Um, so if you have encountered these publishers and other uh, journals and conferences, you're definitely not alone. Many academics receive direct solicitations from predatory and exploitative publications. And really, I think the more you publish, the more of these solicitations you're likely to get. And if you're in a discipline that produces article-based scholarship, you are much more likely to encounter these publishers than if you're in an area that is just working with like putting out monographs and things like that. Um, these really tend to target uh, people who publish articles and there are reasons for that, which we'll get into. So open access. These are research outputs which are distributed online and they're free of cost or other barriers. And this is important because making your scholarship available via open access helps people find it quicker. It provides access to more people, so it enriches the public, and it can help improve education as well by making research outputs available to everyone. And open access sharing of scholarship can be compatible with everything that you see on this slide. So as an author, you can retain copyright. It is completely compatible with peer review. It can generate revenue. Of course, with most academic articles and things like that, it's not you as an author who is getting that revenue. It is the publisher. So keep that in mind. Um, it can be compatible with prestige, with quality, with advancing careers and many other uh, ways that you would or things you would associate with traditional scholarship. So the primary difference between open access scholarship and traditional scholarship, anyone have any thoughts? Money. Yes, that's a good one, Sarah. So the difference is actually that the bills are not being paid by the readers, so they don't function as access barriers. Money is still definitely involved, but it's not the reader who is paying a subscription fee or paying um, like an article, a charge to access an article at a paywall. Um, open access scholarship is free for readers to access but it's not free to produce or publish. There are still costs associated with creating that research and with making it available to people. So how does this work in terms of money? Uh, these are some of the publication models. The one that we're gonna be focusing on today is traditional open access, where your journals are not being funded through subscriptions, but instead by subsidies from institutions, by what's called article processing charges or APCs. They could be funded through advertising or membership fees, but they are not being funded in that sort of traditional or conventional way 
where institutions, libraries, or, or individuals have to subscribe to get that content. So the article processing charges, these are also sometimes known as publication fees. These are actually being charged to authors to make a work available through open access. And it, these fees can sometimes be paid by the author, the author's institution, or their research funder. And I wanna say that this is not the same as sort of a pay to play model where anyone who has money can publish whatever they want. This in quality, uh, legit journals, they, these articles should still be going through peer review and all of those normal steps that would uh, evaluate the quality of the content. And then that article processing charge is being paid to fund the work of that journal in terms of hiring people to do that work. So these are APCs can generate income to cover those publishing costs. They sometimes can be funded through financial awards or credits. And I've got links on this slide and we'll share these slides afterward. Uh, the library here at UNCG does offer financial um, awards in, every year to authors who are publishing open access works. And we also have some publishers that we work with that have, uh, we've gotten some credits that can be applied to certain articles or certain publishers. In very rare situations, you may see APCs waived because of hardship or geographic location. And generally that's happening where you've got researchers who are in like third world countries that really just don't have the institutional support or maybe don't have the grant funded support to uh, pay these APCs, but are still generating research that is valuable. And these can be extremely expensive. Um, you may see them in the like, hundreds of dollar, dollars range, but it's more likely to be like $1,000, $2,000, even $3,000 in some cases, depending on the journal. But there are these predatory or exploitative journals out there, and it's not just limited to open access, that are charging those article processing charges, but they're not doing those things that make uh, a journal legitimate and make sure that scholarship is legitimate. They're not providing peer review. They might not be doing any copy editing, layout. They may just get a manuscript, not even look at it and publish it. So that is not what we want to happen to our scholarship as we're going through uh, processes like peer review, tenure, promotion, all of that. We wanna make sure that we are publishing in journals that are checking the quality of their work before they're putting it out. And sadly, there's no one thing that we can look at with all journals across the board that can provide us a definitive yes or no, this is good or this is bad. This process can really take some research and you may have to look at multiple sources when you're considering journals. This slide has some of the criteria that we consider. We want to make sure that the processes of the journal, things like peer review, are stated and explained. We want them to be clear about their policies related to copyright, open access, and other things. We want to look at the journal's aims and scope. If there are fees, we want to make sure that they're stated and explained up front. Having an ISSN is a good sign, but Bad journals can actually apply for those as well. So it's not the only thing that you wanna look at. If a journal is indexed, if it has good ranking or metrics, that can be useful too. Although there are journals that make up these things and you wanna make sure that if you're uh, not sure, you wanna be clear um, or check into those things. Being listed in the directory of open access journals is a positive sign. The publisher being registered with the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association is another good sign. But again, you can have bad actors, uh, publishers, journals that get into these uh, affiliations and organizations even when they shouldn't. And you also have to think about you, your level, your tolerance for risk or uncertainty for yourself. Um, there sometimes is not a 100% clear answer on some publications, so you have to think about what you are comfortable with. Here's some red flags for journals. Quick turnaround time is a big one. So 
quickly accepting articles with little or no peer review. You see occasionally these kind of sting operations where academics will come up with a fake research study, a fake paper, and then send it out and try to see who will publish it. And that's how some of these journals get found out. They will pick up and publish one of these fake papers. And then you know that there's no peer review or quality control happening. If you are notified about a publication fee only after your manuscript is accepted, that is a bad red flag. Um, but you don't wanna get, you wanna find out these things actually before you submit your manuscript, ideally. Often these journals really aggressively campaign via email for people to submit articles or join editorial boards. They may actually list real academics on their websites without checking with those people in order to try to make their journal look more legitimate or they may completely make up fake academics and list them on their editorial boards. Here's some even more uh, red flags. So you may see these journals having just like one word in their title different from a very established reputable journal and sort of mimicking that website style, trying to trick people into submitting their work. You may find that they have misleading information on their websites. Um, all of these other things that are on here. So direct email solicitations are very common. They try to flatter people, praising your work. They may include citations of your recent papers, um, information about actual scholarship that you have produced. They do tend to target people who are publishing because they think that they are more likely to be looking to publish more. But they don't always do research on what you're doing. So the area of their journal may have nothing to do with your work. You may see poor grammar and spelling in these communications, though some of these are really cleaning up their act in terms of how they look and it uh, makes things a little more complicated for us. Um, they may also offer you opportunities, quote unquote, to join editorial boards or serve as peer reviewers or things like that. So here's an example. This one is full of red flags and this went straight to my spam folder, but I do like to look at these sometimes to see what these journals are doing. So even just the subject line in this case is a giant red flag. Pleasure to have your article. No reputable journal is going to send out something with that kind of subject line. They've got part of my name in at the beginning, Dear Anna R, greetings from Applied Psychiatry. I'm a librarian. None of my work has anything to do with psychiatry, um, but they are looking for me to submit a manuscript which will be published for $399. And also I can refer colleagues and students who might be able to submit one for the same publication fee. So this one's pretty obvious. I don't want anything to do with this journal. But let's look at some other examples. Sometimes they're very obvious, sometimes they are not. So here's a pretty common form. Um, this is just a snippet from one email. We think you could make an excellent contribution based on your expertise and your following paper. And then they've got a direct citation of an article that I recently had published. And that information is accurate. Yes, they pulled that citation from somewhere. And then it goes on to say that this is a special issue that's uh, going to deepen the knowledge of industrial symbiosis and blah, blah, blah. This has nothing to do with my work. So probably hundreds, if not thousands of academics got this same article or the same email, and they are hoping that a couple of people are willing to say that they're interested. I also got a questionable peer review solicitation. So this is a predatory journal that's actually, I guess, trying to do some level of peer review but it's from the Journal of Aerospace something. And they're asking me to review a manuscript entitled Re-Entry of Spacecraft to Earth Atmosphere. So my only qualification potentially for doing something like this is that my last name is Kraft. You don't want me being a peer reviewer on your paper related to aerospace engineering. Um, so uh, this, this just is kind of funny to me, but it, it is sad in that if this is a real article that some real academic is trying to get published, um, this journal is not doing their due diligence in terms of how this process should be going. 
So here are two snippets from a website. Do y'all see any red flags here? Yes, yes, yeah, y'all are, um, y'all have found the biggest issue on this, the biggest red flag, that short publication time. So this was from last year. We want you to submit your paper on or before July 20th. We will accept or reject within five to six days and your paper will be published by July 30th. There is no way that your paper is going to go through peer review potentially come back with comments, um, make edits, go through layout, typesetting, copy editing, all of that. If you're submitting it on the 20th of July, that whole process cannot happen within 10 days. That's just not possible. Um, there are a couple of other smaller red flags here. So the journal title, I mean, that could be a real journal, but it's extremely vague. International Journal of Arts and Social Science. Sure, that sounds like it could be real. Um, but you see a lot of these really vague titles when you are looking at predatory journals. And they say right under their header, uh, secured website. That should be a given at this point. So if they're saying that you should be considering them because they have a secured website, you want to look a little deeper than that. But the biggest red flag is that time period that they are saying that your article will be ready within. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's an invitation I got to join an editorial board. They came across a recent article I published. They think the topic is very interesting. They want me to join their editorial board and also submit my future work. This is a very common format for this sort of predatory um, journal to take with these emails. They ask you to join an editorial board and also submit your work. And here is yet another one. So dear Craft AR, greetings. We have learned about your precious paper. No legitimate re reputable journal is going to be referring to your scholarship as precious. Um, <laughs> I just, I, it's this wording is not the sort of thing that you would see. And you're not usually seeing direct solicitations like that, like this either um, from rep reputable publishers. But we're gonna look at this website a little bit just to see some of these um, red flags. So <clears throat> this is their website. At first glance, it looks like it could be real. Again, we've got a very vague title, International Journal of Information and Communication Science Sciences. This could be real. Um, we see a lot of the things that I would want to check into um, along that bar along the top and then on the navigation on the left, aims and scope, all of these things, those are things that I would be wanting to read about. So they've got it laid out, that's looking pretty good. Um, but we go through to the editorial board. And when I looked at this, it was 2019. Um, and I see a red flag here. So this says editor in chief from February 2016 to the end of December 2017. So who's the editor in chief in 2019 when this is sent out? And then all of these people who are also on here as editorial members and peer reviewers, they could be real. Um, those are names, those are person shaped images, but there's no information about them. So this is looking pretty sketchy. And I go through to look at the charges associated with publishing here. And they tell me that the article processing charge for this journal is 670 US dollars. And for reference, a little further down, it says if you don't want your paper to be published in this journal, the following journals are also available for your reference. And look, these, these other journals are much more expensive, almost $1,500 for seven, several of these. Um, so maybe this is actually a bargain. Maybe I should go ahead and publish in this cheaper journal. This is a common tactic, sort of making it look like this journal is a deal where other journals are not going to be. So backing up, these are some of the red flags from that website. This banner, which we didn't see on the previous page, but um, 
some publication in some recommended journals, one paper for free. If you ever encounter something like this, where they're saying, submit one, publish, pay to publish one, publish another for free, you want to run the other way. Um, your precious paper, not knowing who the editor in chief is, and then the register link was spelled incorrectly. These are all some of the red flags that are associated with this particular journal and publisher. But not all predatory journal websites and emails show these immediate glaring red flags. So if a journal is unfamiliar to you, you want to evaluate it carefully when you're considering publishing there. So a great thing to do to start is just to go ahead and Google it. Don't just read about what the journal or publisher says about itself, read about what others say. What I usually do is take that journal title or publisher name, put it into Google or another search engine and include the word predatory. You may find a lot of information from other academics who have experience with that journal or and are saying, this is good, this is bad. Um, you know, people can say whatever they want on the internet. So you want to take things with a grain of salt, but you can often find some helpful information that way. Looking at the directory of open access journals can be helpful. This is not, again, a silver bullet because bad journals can get in there, but they, they do try to keep um, those questionable journals out. There are a couple of resources that librarians often use. Beale's List and a site called Stop Predatory Journals. And I've got these with asterisks next to them because not everybody likes these sites. Um, these, are, these are based on opinions and sometimes the information can be out of date. So you wanna again, take this information with grains of salt or teaspoons of salt or whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but these are efforts within the library profession to try to track publishers and journals that engage in questionable practices. So again, this is not a 100% yes, no, good, bad situation, but it can help inform your discovery on this. If a journal says that it is indexed in a major search system, something like Web of Science or PubMed, you might actually go to that system and look and see if you can find their content. Um, they may just say that they're indexed in PubMed, but they're not really in there. And then there's a resource called Ulrichs. Um, it's not the most user friendly, but your librarian can help you with that. There is a link to, to it here, but you can actually see where a journal is indexed. You also want to look at the content from that journal. Are they publishing quality content? Does their content align with their subject areas? Or are they publishing about librarianship in a psychiatry journal? Um, if you know someone who's on the editorial board, consider reaching out and asking them about their experience. If you reach out to them and they say, wow, I've never heard of that journal. What am I doing on their site? That's a very bad sign. Here is a graphic from SUNY Stony Brook that goes through some of these steps that you might look at. It's pretty small here, but the link is available at the bottom for if you want to look at this later. And this is another good site, Think, Check, Submit. And they have a, a checklist with some of the things that we've talked about already today. So thinking about if you know the journal, can you contact them? Are they clear about peer review, indexing, fees, and all these other things. And then down at the bottom, uh, these industry initiatives, these are the Committee on Publication Ethics, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, the Directory of Open Access Journals. Those are some of the, the initiatives that you might uh, look at to see if the publisher is a member. There are some gray areas. New journals can be difficult to uh, evaluate sometimes. And you have to kind of look at these on a case by case basis. Here is, I didn't include the specific journal, but this is the process I went through with one recent question. So the journal was listed in the directory of open access journals. That was a good sign. The publisher was a member of the Committee on Publication Ethics, another good sign. Their website looked good, no immediate glaring red flags. Um, they were clear about their policies, but the journal content wasn't indexed anywhere. No uh, Web of Science, no PubMed, nothing like that. 
and the journal was pretty new. So it was only established about four years ago. So in this case, we've got some things that look good and some things that we're not so sure about. And you really have to think about what you are comfortable with. With new journals, it does take time to get established, just like with new academics. So if you know people who are involved in developing the journal, that could help you make the decision. If the journal is clearly associated with a university or a scholarly group, that might help. And then looking at the publisher, if they publish other things that are reputable or if they publish things that are not reputable, that can help make your decision. And there can be other journals where it's not a clear yes or no. Uh, this journal in this case was listed in the directory of open access journals, but I discovered that the publisher was previously on Beale's list, a site that tracks questionable and predatory publishers, but I learned that it had been removed. So maybe the publisher or the journal improved their practices, or maybe they sued to have their name taken off of it. Not really sure. I did see that the journal content was indexed in PubMed, and then we have this sort of rapid publication turnaround time. Manuscripts are peer reviewed and a first decision provided to authors approximately 15.3 days after submission. That's possible, but it's pretty quick. Acceptance to publication is undertaken in 2.9 days. This again, it's possible. And they're not saying that they're gonna do the whole process of layout, copy editing, um, returning it for corrections, things like that. So this. It seems like it could be possible, but also anytime there's a really rapid turnaround, it makes me a little, uh, I, I question whether or not they're doing their due diligence. So there may not be a clear answer in some cases. You can find conflicting information online or learn conflicting information from colleagues. Some people may say they had positive experiences. Others may tell you absolutely stay away from this journal or this publisher. And here you really have to think about your own comfort level with the situation. If it's a very important paper that you absolutely need for your tenure portfolio or for something like that, you wanna make sure that you are comfortable with the journal and the publisher that you are giving it to. Because with predatory journals, if you submit your manuscripts to them, you may not be able to get it back. And what I mean by that is they may publish it regardless of what you tell them. Even if you say, don't publish this, or I'd like to retract this manuscript. If they have it, they may put it up in an effort to convince other academics that they are somewhere that they would want to submit their work. So if you need help evaluating a journal before you submit your manuscript, you can contact me and your liaison librarian. I've got the liaison's contact information here. Um, so that's a great way to start. And I've got some more slides. I'm gonna to try to get through them pretty quickly. Um, what if you find out that a journal is predatory after you have submitted an article? Or if one of your students has submitted a work to a predatory journal? This does happen. And you definitely don't have to go through this alone. Um, here's what I would recommend doing. You may be getting aggressive communications from the journal. So pause that. It doesn't mean that you say, don't ever write me again or something like that. Just, just pause, save all the emails and documentation and other information, everything that you've gotten from the journal and contact your liaison librarian and me. And depending on the situation, we may bring in Terry Shelton, who has helped us with this type of work in the past. So we really don't want you to be in this situation. What we want is for you to check out journals before you send them your work, because we don't want you to be in a situation where you are, your paper is being published by a predatory journal and you're not gonna be able to actually get it into a reputable journal. So checking out the journal or asking your liaison librarian for help first is better than being in a situation where you have to check on the journal or deal with the predatory journal after submitting an article. Quickly, are there predatory conferences? Sadly, the answer is yes. Um, these are set up to appear as legitimate, but again, they're not providing editorial control over presentations and they're charging those really high fees for people to come and speak. 
And we see some of the same red flags. I'm not going to go through them all right now, but they're very similar to what you see with journals. Rapid acceptance, nonsense content, very high fees, things like mimicking names and websites. You may actually see these conferences hold, being held in the same city as an established conference around the same time. And more red flags, those direct email solicitations are common. They may try to get you to attend by telling you that you're up for an award. And I've got an example of that on the next slide. This actually came from uh, Sam, who is here today. This was sent to a faculty member that she works with. So our team of experts spent about three months analyzing various profiles, and now we have a list of potential nominees for the leadership award. Very vague. It gives me immense pleasure to inform you that your name is on the list. So they want you to email them back and say that, wow, I'm so flattered. I would love to be considered for the leadership award. And then they want to um, hopefully get you to pay them a lot of money to attend this conference and win this vague award or not. And this was also a piece of that email scheduled for April, 2021. Who knows if there will be in-person travel there, but this was an earlier time. Uh, it will be a three-day affair that will see academicians, educationists, and the like discussing strategies to smoothen the process of education transmittal. So we all know that our uh, disciplines can be very jargony, but when you see jargon like this, think about, is this real? Like, are these words that people would use in my discipline, or is this just kind of nonsense that is trying to make people think that it's important. In this case, I think it's more like nonsense. And then is it truly predatory or is it just a for-profit conference? There are for-profit conferences out there that have really good content, but they are really just making money for whatever organization is putting on the event. And these are often free for the speakers, but they're very expensive for attendees. Is it worth speaking at or attending one of these? That's up to you. So if you're in doubt about a journal, publisher, or conference, ask a librarian. Again, we've got the library liaisons link, and you are also welcome to contact me. And here are the resources from today. So everything that we looked at and um, all the links to those. And if you have questions, or if you need assistance evaluating a journal or a publisher, or if you would like to learn more about this topic through a presentation for your course or your department, you are welcome to get in touch. So that's what I have for y'all today. Sorry that it went a little bit over the 30 minutes. Um, but if you've got questions now, I would be delighted to answer. Okay. okay, well, as people are thinking through their questions, there haven't been any questions yet. Um, I will uh, quickly let you all know the next one coming up for the series. So we run two series. Uh, we finished up our series on online learning and innovation where we talk about instructional technology. Uh, but we did have a lot of uh, great stuff this semester. If you want to check this out on the link I'm about to send, it's a tab at the top. Uh, but the next one we have coming up for research and applications is November 9th at 11 a.m. Joe Klein will be talking about free data visualization tools for your research tool belt. And then on November 10th at 11 a.m., Jenny Dale will be talking about what we talk about when we talk about algorithms. And if people have time today, here is a quick assessment form about this session or if you attended other ones this semester. And uh, here is where these webinars <laughs> live as well as the sign up form if you're interested in the ones coming up but does anyone have any questions for anna yeah i see a hand raised hi anna this is dan her hi thank dan you very, thank you very much and I, I know you mentioned um that somebody may choose to still you know publish in one of these journals if they're in a crunch for tenure whatever would you like to comment on the long-term implications of having one of those predatory journal articles in your CV long-term? Yeah, great question. And so I actually want to clarify um, 
with the comments earlier, what I meant was when you're thinking about publishing and you in one of these journals or not publishing in one of these journals, and you have got like a tenure portfolio coming up or you're up for review for full professor or reappointment or whatever it might be, your committee is likely going to be looking at where you have been publishing, especially if you are in a situation where you've got external reviewers, they're gonna be looking at those publications and thinking about if they are quality publications. So you don't wanna just throw your publications into any old journal that's out there that will accept them. You wanna make sure that it's a quality venue. And even, and even if it's a newer journal and you're not, really so sure you want to think about what the implement implications may be down the line because if you have put really good research into a bottom of the barrel journal your research may not be meaningful um, or may not be recognized as meaningful down the line um, based on a lack of peer review um, a lack of quality control in a journal so it can have significant um, effects on you later in your career if you put your research into journals like this. So think about journal quality um, at any stage in your career, really. But um, because your, your CV, your works are going to be scrutinized when you go up for various academic reviews and things like that. Um, Dan, did that answer the question or is there anything else that? Yeah, I, I just sort of also a follow-up. And actually, I'd love to chat with you maybe after this uh, webinar at some point, because I've, I've been um, looking for emerging trends and um, there, there are, are topics. And I do that the same web of science by putting in some keywords that may not normally go together. Um, but if I get some hits and I go back over time, I can start seeing maybe an increase in the number of publications for an area. There's something called synthetic biology, for example, and um, or semi-synbio. Um, and it's interesting to see where those terms first appeared in journals. And so that'd be for our follow-up conversation. But sometimes there's a trade uh, consideration. Do I publish in a really high impact journal like science or nature? Or should I publish in a, uh, a peer-reviewed journal that is really focused on my discipline that may have a lower impact factor? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it may actually depend on your discipline. I was talking to a, um, a person who is in the biological sciences specifically whose work is with um, trees. He's a botanist. And he was saying, we were talking about predatory journals and he was saying to me, well, you know, for us, it doesn't matter as much because if it's a new species that's being identified, it's a new species, no matter where it's published. And I thought, well, like that, that wouldn't be, that's not gonna be the case for a lot of um, disciplines because if it's new groundbreaking research, if it's not going through peer review, then your, your work is going to, be potentially under fire uh, down the line. Um, so I think it, that that sort of a disciplinary, an understanding of the discipline and what is expected is going to inform that question. Yeah. Um, and there may be some, some uh, pieces of that that are affected by what institution you're at as well. So knowing what who your reviewers, what journals they think are worth publishing in can, for better or worse, um, affect how they view your work. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's. It, I wish that there were easy answers on all of these things, yeah. but sadly, it's there are a lot of gray areas, and I, I wish that it was a little easier. But I don't think it will ever get to that point. Right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. I have a quick question, um, but if someone else does, please talk because I can 
I can ask Anna later too, but we had an experience in one of my departments where, you know, faculty were kind of uh, looking at a journal and kind of thinking through all these things, like Anna said, and really what we kind of found too was that they had improved. Like, I think they had it like one time been kind of considered, you know, had been like targeted, you know, in a way, but then they got better, you know, so their metrics were rising. Do you see that, Anna, often? Um, mm -hmm. What you just said, there's a lot of gray areas, but I just wonder if there's ever, um, you know, if they're like, if they're improving, if you see that in certain subject areas, um, or if it's kind of like once they're predatory, they're always predatory, kind of. Stuff. Yeah, that's a good question. So I can think of a specific publisher that was considered predatory for a, a, quite a while and now is on sort of people's good lists. Um, and often when you look up publishers, when you're doing research about them <clears throat> and that kind of lateral reading that Jenny mentioned in the comments, you find their Wikipedia pages and usually there is a, um, like a controversy section and you can read about the history of that journal and the scandals that they have had or the publisher um, and that they were listed on such and such list of bad journals, but now they're not because they're improving their practices. <clears throat> and I, it is certainly possible for publishers and journals to improve their practices. It is also possible for them to deteriorate over time. So I think, I, again, this is getting back to, I wish that this was easy. It definitely is not. Um, and it, it makes you as a researcher need to be very careful at, about looking at these publications and mm -hmm. these publishers and considering what's right for you and what you're comfortable with. And hopefully if you've got uh, good mentors and people that you're working with, they can help direct you as a graduate student. Um, because, I mean, for me, I wish that I knew the name of every bad journal that's out there and I could just, if you told me I'm thinking about X journal, I could say yes or no. Um, but I don't even know every journal in my discipline, let alone the ones that are in all of y'all's disciplines. Um, so I have to do research about all of them. Um, and except the, you know, the big ones in my discipline and some of the others that have been around forever. and we know about, um, but there's there's a lot of research that has to happen to check on these and to sort of keep up with changes with them. Sorry, I wish it was easy. Yes, I wish everything was easy. <laughs> but um, okay, well, we're right at 145. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, uh, now is the time. Um, if not, we will uh, end it. But Dan, do you have another question? I just want to know if, if Anna, if you have a few minutes, could you stay on after this for a few minutes? Yeah, I can. And actually, there's a question came to me um, privately. Is there any website to check journal indexes? Um, and so is, for the person who asked, does this mean to check where a journal is indexed to see uh, where their content, which indexers are picking up their content or does it mean something else? I'm getting, I'm having a hard time picking which journal to publish in, which fits, uh, fits my research. Oh, the journal scores, okay. So looking at impact factor and metrics, things like that. Okay, yeah, so I don't know of one list or resource that's out there where you would be able to see all, um, all metrics. Sam does a good presentation on research metrics. Sam, do you have a recommendation for places to go to look at impact factor and other? Yeah, I'm trying to find, we have a presentation that sometimes um, Anna and I do together um, in long workshops <laughs> beyond the 30 minutes where we talk about citation metrics and journal metrics, kind of just the getting started because, um, you know, kind of similar to predatory journals, it, people do it differently. Like, uh, I think we heard Dan mention like Web of Science, like they have their own impact factors, but like we have a subscription to Scopus, which is a different form of impact factors, but they're similar. But a free one that's pretty good, I'm dropping in the chat is 
Shima, Shimago. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. I would say it's science, Shimago. So that one you can sometimes find journals in there um, in terms of their metrics. Another trick, um, and I'll try to find the link to the presentation real fast, is that Google Scholar does index uh, H, I think H index factors um, that you can uh, switch it to a Google like when you're using Google Scholar, you can search a journal and then it will give you basic information about the metrics, right? Based on the H index factor. I'm pretty sure it's the H index factor. So I'll um, find that presentation and drop it into the chat. Um, and again, you're um, depending, I mean, if you're one of my students, we can meet about this later. Um, but uh, you can also, if you're, I'm not your students, um, if you're not my student, in terms of I'm not your liaison librarian, you might want to meet with your individual liaison librarian because we have you know maybe different opinions and different things so here is the um workshop digital methodologies workshop we did yeah so if you're in education your librarian is amy harris hauk and um she's uh good sorry this is my daughter rose by me <laughs> um so yeah so um i would definitely get in touch with her um but that link i dropped in there has a presentation on open access, which Anna talked about, of course, related to um, predatory journals, um, and then citation metrics, Sotero citation management, and uh, what else? I think those are the basics. Oh, research identity, of course, which uh, Anna does some great stuff on that as well, uh, which research identity, too, is about getting, you know, getting your research out there in a safe way um, and a legal way. <laughs> um, so, great. Any other questions? I'm well, glad that was, uh, went longer. And I'm, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, and uh, if Dan and Anna um, want to stay, um, if you, if you can stay on too, if I can Sam. add the resources in the follow up email. Um, and I will. Yes. Yeah, so I will send the link out to the presentation again, which has a lot of the links that Anna mentioned and the links that have come up on citation metrics, um, which of course is. Uh, closely uh, intertwined with predatory journals, um, I'll send that out as well. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording um, so I don't have to close caption all of it. <clears throat>